instructions. So at this point, let me turn it over to Evaristo to introduce our distinguished speaker. Evaristo? Uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Charlie, for uh, introducing uh, uh, the, the broad uh, IAC uh, Commons Week. And uh, thank you for coordinating this across the different regions. My name is Evaristo Mapeza, and I'm with the International Water Management Institute. And I'm also uh, uh, part of the ISC Executive Committee and also uh, coordinating the Africa Group. Uh, today we have um, a good presentation and uh, we encourage uh, people who are participating in this, those who are not members of ISC, if you could join uh, ISC and if you are interested in becoming uh, or receiving uh, emails from uh, the ISC regional grouping, please do send in your email uh, in, the chat in the chat box. So I will briefly introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Claudia Chikojo. Uh, he's a research director with the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi, uh, in Kenya. And uh, his talk today is uh, it's called uh, Globalizing Water Commons in Sub-Saharan Africa, Tensions Between Theory and Practice. And what we are hoping for is that uh, you have his uh, presentation. Uh, I will not go maybe more into his CV, but we'll try to put a link so that you, if you want to see more details on him, uh, you can get uh, these details. But uh, we will then also uh, expect him to present, and then after that, I'll moderate the discussion. Uh, uh, Claudius, in the interest of time, uh, could you maybe begin your, your presentation? Thank you. Um, th thanks very much, uh, Evaristo and Charles, for the introductions. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Uh, in the ISC family and beyond. I hope I find you well in these difficult times when we can no longer meet face to face and greet each other more warmly. Nevertheless, for this particular event, we will do the best we can under the circumstances. My name is Claudia Chikojo and I am with the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi as already indicated. I'm really honored to be presenting the keynote address for the Africa region in 2020. Uh, so I really thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my, the insights that have been uh, coming out of research and practice in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with uh, regards to the water commons. Most of uh, the insights uh, you, uh, uh, for that you will find in this presentation are more informed by experiences in Southern Africa because that's where I have carried mo uh, out most of my work, even though I am a bit more uh, equally attuned with uh, developments in, in East and West Africa. So let me go straight into the address without uh, wasting too much time since time is of the essence. I hope uh, we will have a vibrant discussion. The topic is about globalizing water commons in Sub-Saharan Africa with a specific focus on tensions between theory and practice. Um, in terms of the presentation itself, I will uh, briefly touch on uh, water commons fundamentals for Africa what I think are the key uh, issues uh, and what, 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 what are the water commons we want? What is it we want in terms of water commons in this sub-region? I'll also then zero in on uh, uh, issues of globalizing the commons, the theory, uh, what has changed uh, in terms of uh, both theory and practice, and then I'll close with uh, lessons learned over the years. As I've indicated, I will draw more lessons from Southern Africa uh, just for, 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 for practical reasons. In terms of the fundamentals, I've listed a couple that I think we should uh, bear in mind as we go through this session. First of all, I think we all know that water belongs to all people and ecosystems or the earth itself. Therefore, it must be available as and when needed. Secondly, we have a duty to pass on the resource in sufficient quantities and quality 
to the next generations. In other words, we need to be managing the resource sustainably. And that is commonly agreed. The next item is that water is life. You cannot substitute water with anything else. So it is not possible for you, for example, to decide to drink a, a, a soft, take a soft drink when you are feeling thirsty. You could do that once or twice, but over a period of a week or a month, a month it's not possible. You still need water. The same goes for production purposes. You cannot irrigate uh, your crops with any other liquid besides water. Water is recognized as a human right, and this is something we have to bear in mind when we plan to manage and govern the resource. It often triggers conflict, especially in cases where it is scarce, and that is why it is vital for collective uh, imagination and thinking to go into how best we govern the resource to avoid conflicts. We know that with uh, the emergence of climate change and the increase in population, every drop now counts. The issues of scarcity in certain parts of the real world and parts of the continent are becoming more and more acute. And that's why the every drop counts uh, uh, age is becoming more and more uh, important. So those are some of the fundamentals but there could be more. In terms of the commons that we want, the water commons we want, I would start with the Rio Summit of 1992, which I think introduced a new conundrum for water commons in Africa and other parts of the world. Particularly when you look at water as a public good with a social and economic value in all its competing uses. Uh, this particular conundrum will run through this presentation and I think by the time I finish I will have pointed out some of the fundamentals surrounding uh, the difficulties that arise from this particular orientation in governing the water commons. And naturally this conundrum also became part of the commons we want in Africa and elsewhere. For Southern Africa, in 1993, there was an international conference that brought together most of the governments, representatives from most countries in Southern Africa, in Vic Four, Victoria Falls, to discuss the emerging uh, priorities for water commons. It was a watershed moment for the region, particularly in terms of how integrated water resources management has, uh, has been introduced in the region and uh, how it is eventually shaped up in terms of practice. Uh, and this particular conference in a way reinforced the Rio summit and uh, principles emanating from Agenda 21. Uh, and when you look at uh, developments uh, thereafter, you will see the, the decisions made in these inter international conferences running through uh, the, the resource re uh, governance regime that, is, that has eventually emerged, uh, at least in Southern Africa and other parts of the continent. To continue with the water commons we want, one of the issues that came out clearly and that has been accepted is that there is need for equitable access to water. For Southern Africa, redressing historical imbalances in ownership, allocation and use of water has become a key issue. It's something that we want, we aspire for, particularly in terms of redistributing water and other related resources from the haves to the have-nots. Another key issue that has emerged that we want and has been actualized in policy is that water belongs to the state. In other words, the state is the steward for the resource on behalf of the citizens. To continue, there has been massive institutional reconfiguration. This is part of what we want, and most governments and key stakeholders in the sector have agreed that there is need for institutional reconfiguration 
and it has actually been happening, particularly with a focus on managing the resource at the smallest appropriate scale. We have seen new catchment management agencies, sub catchment councils, and so on emerging in different countries. This is part of what we have said we want, both government and practitioners and researchers. Other issues that are part of the equation include the need to devolve power to local structures, particularly in terms of decision making over resource allocation. This has emerged, there are att attempts to actualize it. There's also been an emphasis on stakeholder participation, including specifications for gender considerations in how we make decisions and how we allocate, reallocate the resource. There's also been a big focus on redefining the water permitting or licensing models, uh, particularly with reference to water as an economic good. So where we are seeing water as an economic good, how do we license? How do we provide access through licensing models in various countries? This has emerged, has emerged as a key consideration, but also equally important is the issue of looking at water uh, at, at environment at the environment and ecosystem goods and services as a, a, a water user that requires particular consideration when we reallocate the resources. Uh, in all in all, we have seen attempts to devolve uh, power to local structures. Integrated water resources management has become the buzzword. It is the guiding framework uh, within which we have seen the changes, systemic changes in management of the resources and governance. It offers as aspirational and attractive solutions to water governance challenges. And I think this is something we have said we want in Sub-Saharan Africa. It has been embraced by both uh, global players governments in Africa and scholars alike. One thing I like about the changes that have happened, particularly in Southern Africa, is, is that both policymakers and practitioners have said, talk is cheap, uh, the time for talking is over, let us learn by doing, and I think this is very impressive. And that's why you will see almost the whole of the region implementing water sector reforms, learning by doing uh, and course correcting along the way. We have seen massive water policy and law reforms, which is again very impressive. Some of them being uh, categorized as uh, the most progressive pieces of legislation in terms of equity, how they deal with equity, how they deal with environmental water requirements and how water is viewed as a human right in, 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 in statutory law. This I think is impressive. And you can check in any of these countries, you will see pieces of leg legislation and policy that have been uh, crafted in line with IWRM principles. We have seen new organizational structures that are either through the devolution model or the, the, the model of deconcentration in terms of decentralization. So there are new organizational structures on the ground in various countries that are grappling with some of the challenges or the opportunities uh, evident in this landscape. We have seen more water users become part of the governance structures, a whole mix that we have never seen before, where you find rural residents, commercial farmers, government officials, and so on, all sitting together in new uh, institutions to decide on how the resource is governed. Of course, a new water licensing regime has also emerged, particularly with the user pays principle in mind. This is happening, uh, and I think these are some of the impressive changes you will see on the ground when you check. Another impressive thing is that there's more awareness raised across different stakeholder uh, social groups particularly regarding the utility of water in economic production processes. There's also now much more awareness regarding the importance of ecosystem goods and services, 
There are many things we have taken for granted in various social settings, particularly ignoring the importance of ecosystem goods and services, but I think there is much more awareness across the board. More importantly, we have seen standardized reform models across countries based on IWRM principles. Uh, if you read the water sector reform policy for, for Malawi, you read all of them, you will have read all of them. Even if you go to Tanzania or South Africa, the pillars of the reform model are basically the same, which implies a, a, a clear globalization of norms and approaches, uh, especially in Southern Africa. Uh, but perhaps this might also be happening in other parts of the continent and uh, outside the continent as well. What has not changed, and I think this is important if we are to understand uh, our progress or lack, lack of it on the ground. I think attempts for de to, to, to implement a, a devolved uh, structure, it has happened to some extent, but you will still you will see that uh, most of the structures on the ground still have a lot of government technocrats who are quite visible, playing a key role, providing guidance, in some cases leading processes and decision making. So devolution on its own, in the pure sense of the word, has not really happened. Perhaps this is actually realistic, mainly because uh, the presence of local expertise and capacity on the ground cannot be taken for granted. And when you attend some of the forums where these new institutional structures are making decisions, you can see the gaps in capacity and ex expertise. That requires continued involvement of technocrats. Many of the new structures have also struggled operationally. In some cases, some have yet to be dissolved and reconstituted. So in a sense, we would say this is still work in progress. Uh, this, uh, the baby steps have been, have been taken, but we still have a long way to go. I think, uh, for example, only last month, the Minister of, uh, responsible for water in South Africa was dissolving uh, three or four catchment management agencies for various reasons, mostly related to poor uh, operational uh, uh, possibilities on the ground. So this is the reality. Uh, nevertheless, for me, I think this is work in progress. Uh, the baby steps have been made and we still we can still build on the on the base that we have laid in different countries. Participation of previously disadvantaged uh, groups, the so-called have not, has been challenging. Precisely because for a long time they have been dis disempowered. And suddenly they've, they are expected to sit on these uh, new institutional structures uh, and contribute meaningfully. This cannot take place overnight. Uh, the playing field is not level. Uh, it is really almost uh, too ambitious for us to expect rural farmers, for example, to be participating on the same level with commercial farmers who have many decades of experience in dealing with uh, decision making over water allocation and sharing. So the playing field is not level and uh, we cannot wipe out decades of disempowerment overnight. Water as an economic good is still to be realized on the ground. Um, it does not make sense when they have not, have not have remained, they have not. It doesn't make sense for us to expect that water as an economic good will, uh, will have any meaning to them until such a time as and when they are able to use uh, water for economic production purposes on a bigger scale than normal subsistence. If you look at the processes in South Africa and Zimbabwe, this is a reality. And therefore, until we are able to address equity and equality in access to resources and use of water as an economic good, it will, it, it, it will remain very difficult to realize that aspiration. 
Water licensing has been an enormous administrative and conceptual challenge. Um, I know, for example, South Africa was uh, very particular about water licensing, making sure that no one uses water for commercial purposes without a license. And how to administer that across the whole country uh, and how to really conceptualize that in such a way that everybody understands what it means to ob obtain a, a, a water license, which volume of water requires a license and which one does not. So there is an enormous administrative and conceptual uh, challenge that goes with water licensing. And we still haven't overcome that challenge. I think I've mentioned the issue of equity and equality. Ownership of the means of production has not been actualized in a systematic manner, especially when you look at land and water sector reforms being implemented as separate programs in, in various countries. Access to land, especially for commercial purposes, is one direct way of enabling the previously disadvantaged groups to use water in more productive ways. And until we get the land reforms right, it will be very difficult to also get the water sector reforms right. Therefore, the new stakeholders who's, who are supposed to be participating actively in decision making over resource governance do not have a stake. It's, it remains an aspiration and in short, if we ask whether we have addressed poverty and inequality in any systematic uh, manner, I will say no. The answer is no. We still have a long way to go. Customary law continues to coexist side by side with structural law. There is a whole body of knowledge, research and knowledge generated in this domain, which shows that this coexistence of statutory law and customer law in the water commons presents another layer of complications. Uh, you may find that statutory law is fairly straightforward in how you make decisions, how you allocate the resources, but when you intersect that with customer law, the, the, the whole terrain becomes much more complicated. It is not easy for customer law to speak to statutory law. So that's another complication that practitioners and, and the scholars have to grapple with. Have we managed to actualize environmental water requirements? It's a big question. And I think it's a challenging one that we need to continue asking ourselves, uh, especially when you, 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 you consider uh, sometimes the prioritization around environmental water uh, requirements and the domestic water requirements in terms of scarcity. Are we able to overcome that difficult terrain. Overall, we know that a lot has happened in terms of uh, policy and legislative changes. Uh, we now know what we need to be doing, but I think the major struggle is on how exactly to actualize our aspirations for the water commons we want. Let me zero in on lessons learned as I get towards the end of my, my talk. I think in general, IWRM presents a very powerful guiding framework for rethinking how we govern the water commons. That we cannot uh, take away uh, uh, from, from that framework. It is powerful and uh, a very useful tool in articulating what we need, what we want. But changing water governance systems in, is not as straightforward as the, as the IWRM principles imply. So we'll see that standardization that we have observed across countries needs to be moderated by a deliberate localization and adaptation process. We also need to pay attention to the disjuncture between global normative policy prescriptions in local aspirations and realities. I think most of the tensions we see between water as a social good and water as an economic good relate to this disjuncture. 
until we really understand the local aspirations and realities, it is difficult to actualize the global normative policy pres prescriptions. Yes, we have done our best. We are still trying. It's a journey, uh, but that localization is vital and adaptation to local realities. Inequality rem remains a big elephant in the room, and that needs to be dealt with. Issues of poverty and inequality have been with us for decades, and they remain with us and present a big challenge to managing the, uh, and governing water commons in Africa. In terms of conclusion, I think we are in the right direction. As I said, IWRM has a compelling and explanatory uh, planning power. It is uh, a very useful framework for us. So all the efforts that different countries are making to adopt uh, IWRM and implement the principles through uh, particular policy and legislative reforms, I think they are laudable. It's, we are in the right direction. But changing the policy is just one part of the equation. Uh, there is limited evidence of transformed livelihoods in, in sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Africa in, in particular, uh, the, uh, resulting from a shifting landscape of water governance. Therefore, until we start seeing livelihoods really transformed by all these uh, sectoral reforms, it remains an aspiration. We need to continuously reflect on, on what works for Africa and course correct along, along the way. I think the current rigidity we see in the planning processes, particularly at the national level, is failing us. There must be some bit of more flexibility and learn from these processes that we have started, what works and what does not work. Wholesale adoption of these global normative uh, frameworks is not an option, it's not optimal. I think we need to adapt for greater localization. And surprisingly, I don't think this is news. We have said this for many decades. We just need to start uh, making it uh, uh, realistic and achievable and practical on the ground. We need Africa-led African models that can confront the, reality, the realities we face. I'm with, through this presentation, I'm challenging the IASC network members to take on this need and see how best we can develop African models that really work for us. At the same time, we must acknowledge that not all is gloomy. I think when you look at the journey we have uh, gone through since the mid 1990s, we have a huge knowledge base that has grown. A lot of research has been done and published policy uh, briefs and other knowledge products have been produced and shared. There are a lot of training and capacity building programs ongoing since the 1990s, and this is still happening. Among others, I can mention specifically the SADAC Sec Secretariat, uh, the WaterNet Network, which covers East and Southern Africa, the Stockholm Environment Institute, the International Water Management Institute, the Global Water Partnership, GIZ, the Germans, UNESCO IHE, and others. All these key actors have done a lot of work, massive uh, um, amount of programs, uh, program interventions, research and training, particularly of postgraduates, post but also of government practitioners in fields relevant to IWRM. They have done these things since the 1990s. And efforts in that, this direction are continuing. Uh, we must be proud of achievements in these fields uh, arising from interventions by all these actors and others. Uh, so I think there's hope. Indeed, policymakers are starting to listen. They are requesting for our data. Through the work I've done in, Moza in Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi, in South Africa, we have engaged with policymakers and we see them requesting for our data and knowledge products every now and then. We have made presentations 
in parliament, for example. So I think with policymakers listening, there is hope uh, in the horizon. And with all these interventions for capacity building, research and training that have been going on and are still ongoing, there is hope at the end of the tunnel. Um, every door drop still counts more than ever before, mainly because of climate change and the growing populations across different countries. Uh, let me stop here and thank all of you for listening to my talk. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chikozo. I think that was a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, I, can you hear me well? I, I'm getting a bit of feedback. I don't know whether it's just from my end. Yes, no, I can hear you well. There's feedback. Okay. So maybe for participants, if anyone, uh, uh, if you could also mute, just in case if anyone is not muted, so that we, we, are, we minimize the, the feedback. So thank you very much once again, uh, Dr. Chikozo. This was a very interesting uh, presentation. I think uh, I, I, I quite like... Um, especially your title where you say the tension between theory and practice. So far, we have uh, about uh, maybe two questions in the Q&A, but I thought maybe to kickstart before going to the Q&A questions, uh, to kickstart um, the discussion, I could maybe just raise uh, maybe three or four questions uh, on what you have presented. Maybe the, the first one, is on the issue when, where you mentioned, even from the title, you're talking about theory and practice, the tension. I just wanted you to reflect on that. Uh, is, do you see this as a healthy tension or, or is it a necessary tension uh, in your view in terms of uh, 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 practice, uh, uh, the, the, the disconnect between theory and practice? Uh, and then the second one, which uh, I think maybe is a part of the ISC and most of the ISC scholars would uh, want to highlight. I think one of the points you highlighted was that uh, when there is water shortage, uh, it triggers conflict. Or when, um, uh, when water resources are, are in short supply or are scarce, it, this triggers conflict. Could you maybe also on this one try to expand? Because for uh, common scholars, that's where one of the people have uh, most of the attention has been. If you look at uh, maybe the tragedy of the commons and on how scholarship on, on the commons, it was just to rebuild that uh, under what circumstances would uh, would we have conflict? And maybe the I will then quickly go on to the other ones uh, quickly as well before I go to the other ones. Uh, um, the third one is also, I, I like your idea about this uh, sort of um, some sort of a hegemony, or maybe what, what Gramsci would be talking about in terms of hegemon or neo-hegemon, that no matter what changes you might introduce, but it might still be uh, addressed in the favor of, of those who are powerful. So in terms of, so you also mentioned the issue of, uh, under related to this question, you mentioned water commons, the water commons we want. So my question on this one, uh, who are the we, uh, when we are saying uh, the water commons that, um, uh, that we want. And maybe for now, the fourth one, the last one that I could ask for now, you mentioned water as a human right. And uh, we going through, I think at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the issue of COVID-19. And uh, I think we have heard people mentioning that we need to build, build uh, back better. And taking this human rights perspective in terms of uh, what we have seen through the COVID-19, what would be some of your insights uh, in how we can do this better to make sure that uh, uh, the disadvantaged also uh, are part of the solution as we go forward? So for now, I will ask you to respond to these four questions, but after that, uh, I'll also be going to the Q&A section after you have responded. So over to you, uh, Dr. Chikozo, for uh, this initial response before we go to the uh, questions uh, in Q&A. And we encourage participants to add more questions in the Q&A as well. Thank you. Uh, th thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Mapeza. Yes, theory and practice tension, is it healthy? I think it's healthy. Healthy in the sense that when we, 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 we started understanding IWRM and the uh, global normative frameworks, they looked very attractive, right? And I think uh, as a region, we embraced them, attractive as they were. But again, 
as I said earlier on, it, it's good that we said, let's do it. Let's not just talk. And uh, as we started walking the talk, we realized that it's a journey, it's a learning journey. So that, that tension helps us to see the avenues and opportunities for doing things better as we grapple with uh, our water commons and how to best to govern them. So the tension is, in, I think it's inevitable. It's something, it's part of the journey and we just have to learn from it. Uh, probably what matters is how we, we respond to that tension and how we deal, deal with it in, 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 a, in a, a very firm manner. In terms of water shortages and conflict, um, uh, uh, it, yeah, this could be actually the, 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 the topic for another presentation. Water, uh, water, water, water conflicts can happen at various levels. I can just mention three. At the local levels, for example, the usual scenario is the upstream downstream uh, conflicts, where those upstream we have the advantage of being towards the water source so they can access the water earlier than those downstream. They may even pollute the water and affect those downstream without, if they, if they are not uh, careful or if they don't care, uh, that would be uh, very regrettable. But the upstream downstream conflicts are common and I think we have seen on the ground farmers particularly in Zimbabwe and South Africa, bringing out their guns ready to shoot because somebody upstream is holding your water in, in courts. So those things happen and uh, it's a common scenario. But we also have intersectoral uh, conflicts. I know that, for example, in Tanzania, there have been cases where local farmers who are downstream uh, blame sugarcane industries upstream of the Pangani uh, River, saying, oh, those are finishing our water. They should release our water downstream. So those intersectoral uh, conflicts are there as well. You may even have livestock owners and, and, and uh, crop, crop, uh, crop uh, producers. Then we have, of course, the more difficult ones are the, the transboundary conflicts. Some of them cut across nations. I think most recently we have seen Ethiopia uh, and uh, uh, Sudan and Egypt having to go all the way to, 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 to the US for mediation over the waters of the Nile. Again, with uh, an upstream downstream flavor to it. Uh, and we know this has been ongoing for, for many years. I mean, uh, even before independence, Egypt has always uh, been ready to send its army in cases where it feels threatened uh, regarding the waters of the Nile. So those are some of the scenarios, but there could be more in terms of uh, water conflicts. Fortunately, no, we don't see people actually shooting each other. Uh, there's been either resolution, resolving to, uh, to, to, to courts, courts of law or mediation uh, by, by external uh, third parties. So, Yes, conflicts exist, uh, but fortunately they don't tend to physical confrontation in many cases. We also, you also raise the issue of power dynamics and uh, you are saying who is we in terms of uh, the, the water commons we want. By we, I, I'm talking about the, 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 the sector and how we have defined our priorities. Uh, so we have the convergence between what government officials and policymakers want and what uh, researchers and scholars think is good for, 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 for the sector. So by we, I'm referring to the whole sector and how we have ended up crafting the policy reforms and legislative reforms. Water as a human right, linking this to COVID-19 COVID and building better, make better. Yes, you are right. I mean, with COVID-19, COVID those inequalities that I mentioned earlier on uh, have been demonstrated beyond doubt. I mean, availability of water for hand washing and so on has been at the, at the center of the solutions for mitigating um, 
the spread of the pandemic. And there have been fears. There are papers already written about certain localities where people are really poor, for example, in slum areas, in the urban areas, and they don't really have good access to water and other sanitation services. And this is being reflected in COVID-19 uh, uh, processes and how the pandemic has played out. So I, I think it goes back to dealing with poverty and inequality in a very more fundamental way and taking everybody along with us. As the SDGs say, leaving no one behind. Uh, that's what COVID-19 is telling us and how the pandemic has played out and how some of these solutions related to water cannot be applicable across the board, across different social groups that have different access to the resource. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so we will maybe move on to the questions, uh, the questions that have been submitted. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm getting a bit of feedback, uh, but what I wanted to say is that uh, thank you very much for responding to these questions. Uh, we're going on to the questions that have been submitted. Uh, we have one question in the, uh, about two questions which have been submitted in the chat. So the first one is from uh, Adunya. And Adunya says that, uh, uh, I have a question uh, regarding participation of disadvantaged groups in water reforms. What can researchers and academics do to reverse this? And uh, citing, I think, the case of Ethiopia, uh, where maybe uh, commercial large-scale farms are making use of the are making use of the water resources at the expense of the past pastoralists within the same area. And then the second question that we got uh, in the chat, uh, this one came from Brian Bruns. Brian is asking uh, you that could you say more about the potential of groundwater as a commons and its pot potential to contribute to development. So this is the second and now moving on to, uh, to the third question. The third question comes from uh, Lapo Makole in uh, Botswana. And uh, yeah, first question is how much of this low impact is due to lack of deliberate implementation planning? and realistic resource allocation. I hope you got it. And then the next question that uh, she also asks is, uh, do we know if there is ownership or buy-in and relevance and relevance of the policy reforms? Do the public relate with these reforms? Which is almost speaking to one of the comments, uh, the comments that I was asking on the question of who. Maybe if you could address these, uh, I do have more questions, I think more from Lapo and also Charles Dewa has also added a uh, 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 question. So please do add more questions whilst uh, Dr. Chikose is responding to these. Uh, could you uh, please respond to these and then I'll go on to the next, before I go on to the next set of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Evaristo, um, and, and uh, uh, colleagues who have raised all these uh, interesting questions. Some of them relate to what I've uh, already mentioned, so I will quickly go through uh, them in the order that you raised them. What researchers and academics can do uh, to level the playing field? I can, talk, I can only talk from our own experience. Um, I think we were, myself and a group of other researchers were very intimately involved with uh, the reform processes in Zimbabwe, where we were able to attend the dialogue platforms at catchment, sub-catchment, uh, and sub-catchment levels, and even at lower levels, where decisions were being made over water. And when we realized that the, the playing field was not level, our intervention was to have discussion sessions and workshops with the so-called disadvantaged stakeholders, trying to explain what the reform process was all about and build their capacity in appreciating the issues at hand, particularly the key issues that would lead to decisions being made and uh, fundamentally changing how the resource is governed. That's what we were able to do. But I've seen other academics and uh, 
uh, and scholars also doing the same. You need to be engaging with the, these different social groups and provide uh, to the best of your capability the capacity building needed for the stakeholders to reach a stage where they can engage with the key issues in a more informed manner. I think that's the least we can do. Um, it's not really about giving them our publications. That, that will not help. In terms of groundwater as a commons, yes, groundwater has a lot of uh, potential. And in some cases, it faces the same challenges, especially transboundary challenges that you face in surface water, surface water resources. Uh, however, because groundwater is hidden, people don't see it. Uh, at least in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, or uh, Southern Africa particularly, the rules for governing groundwater are not well known. Um, I mean, more, many people just sink balls and wells without regard to the, the law. It's only in cases where the law enforcement officers raise, raise it with their particular stakeholders or users that it becomes an issue. So there is a lot of potential uh, for groundwater and I think other regions uh, have used water for uh, groundwater for pro production. We know in, uh, in places, some places in, uh, like India where over, over abstraction of groundwater has led, has led to depletion and lowering of uh, the water table. So those are some of the issues that come up when you deal with groundwater. But we also need experts in that field to provide guidance on the fundamental issues that arise when you overuse groundwater and how best you may come up with a governance regime that is effective uh, because groundwater might be slightly different from uh, water, uh, surface water sources. In terms of lack of impact, I agree with LAPO, yes, implementation. And that's why I was saying we all know, we now know what needs to be done through all the experience, all the decades of uh, implementation that we have gone through. I think we know what needs to be done, but how to, that's the problem. And this is not only restricted to water commons, but uh, think of any public program, development program, it's, it always goes back to poor implementation. And that's a big challenge. We need uh, implementation programs on top of a particular development initiative, something that is very precise uh, and addresses all the implementation challenges and opportunities that arise when new initiatives are implemented. So I agree, poor, poor implementation is an issue. Do the public relate to the priorities of IWRM? Again, this is uh, a journey that we are going through. I said earlier on, uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of awareness raising, uh, but we have not done enough. We need more efforts in that direction to make sure that the public actually appreciates all of the issues. Uh, so far, only those who are interested in using water have really made efforts to understand the priorities and relate to the agenda for water commons that is emerging in sub-Saharan Africa. So we need more awareness raising to make sure that everybody's on, on the same page. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Koto. Um, if I could then move on to just uh, the second part of Brian's uh, uh, question as well, maybe in the next, uh, in the next uh, segment of your responses, if you could also respond, because he, one of the things that he wanted to look at is the potential to contribute to development, especially if you look at the issue of groundwater, uh, and especially we're talking about COVID and access you see that sub Saharan Africa it plays a key role besides just knowing about the resource, but what is its potential to contribute, I think, uh, to development. And then uh, Lapo also makes a comment that uh, uh, Botswana has also embraced the IWRM, but uh, in terms of uh, the practical changes on the ground, these have been limited. Charles Dewa uh, uh, from Zimbabwe has also sent in uh, uh, his question, uh, he starts off by sort of giving the context by saying that water is increasingly becoming a lethal weapon if we consider unprecedented flooding in Sudan, Senegal, and Niger. How does that sit in the notion of water uh, as a common? 
Maybe if you could respond to this, uh, and then we'll be checking with Charlie on what time we might. Uh, I still have some even few more questions, but we'll be checking with Charlie when we could um, when we could stop. Uh, uh, so if you could respond to these uh, for now, and then uh, we'll, we'll then see what time. Uh, but the time we finish, what time it would be? Thank you. Um, we know in 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 uh, many places. Uh, groundwater is, is, is considered a source of drinking water. Uh, I grew up in the rural areas. We relied on water from the wells and boards. So from that perspective, there is room uh, for direct contribution to development because we need clean drinking water every day. But also for purposes of irrigation, there are places where groundwater is used for irrigation. Uh, and even in Southern Africa, you will see many commercial farmers who have bores that are used to irrigate uh, year, uh, throughout the year. So for agricultural development purposes, groundwater is, is, is a potential source. Industries also can sink bores and uh, use groundwater for their economic production purposes. So the potential is huge. Uh, the challenge is, is identifying the source uh, identifying where it is plenty and, uh, and mining it accordingly. So there's a lot of potential in desert areas. Uh, some communities rely solely on, on, on groundwater. So its potential for development is, is, is not in question at all. Uh, otherwise, the caveat is to, to just make sure that it's, it's uh, sustainably mined and, and, and uh, um, used. In terms of flooding becoming a threat, uh, this is not uh, really new, uh, but of course with uh, the increasing uh, incidence of flooding and droughts as part of uh, climate change, we need to pay more attention. Uh, I mean, we have had floods every now and then. I think in Southern Africa, we have had 10 year cycles since 1982, uh, but the cycle is even changing. The flooding is getting more and more frequent. What it means is that uh, these disasters must become part of the governance regime and the key issues that we deal with. In other words, we have to think about disaster preparedness, both for, for, for times of scarcity and for times of uh, floods. I think Sudan and, uh, and Kenya and some of the countries in East Africa are suffering now no one could ever imagine Sudan having floods because most of the time uh, they are suffering from scarcity. Uh, it's a desert mostly, so it's definitely a big threat and it's, uh, which is growing more and more uh, in, in, in stature. And we need to be embedding a disaster preparedness in our plans uh, for, for, for managing the resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claudius, for, for sort of uh, bringing this to, to, to respond to these questions. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be going into the next set of questions, but just to highlight that uh, Brian has also maybe shared some of the, uh, our easy, the International Water Management Institute's uh, publications uh, on groundwater being led by one of our, uh, our sort of long-term researchers, uh, uh, Tusha and also Namara. So some of those have been shared in the chat for those who might want to have a, a look at that. Maybe for me from now, I think I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Chikozo for your time uh, in uh, this presentation. And I thank the participants for staying and for uh, the questions that we have raised and for anything that uh, might not be raised, we are also sharing this. Uh, for now, let me hand over to Charlie, who is now uh, on standby. Charlie, over to you. Thank you, Everosto, um, and, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, we're about out of time. Uh, if anybody still has questions uh, for Dr. Claudius, feel free to put it in the Q&A and maybe type in your email address um, while we're still together. But I guess I'd like to ask one as we close. Um, Dr. Claudius, as you, as you closed your talk, you challenged IASC to run a program or, or to do something to help with water governance questions in Africa. And one of the things about the International Association for the Study of the Commons I've always appreciated 
is its efforts to connect and create dialogue between researchers and practitioners. Um, Evaristo, you just ran a successful ISC online conference not too long ago. Um, so I'm wondering, is it possible to consider um, in the future some kind of ISC programming that specifically focuses on water governance in African countries? And, and is there a model that is possible to do something that actually connects with, uh, as you said, so-called disadvantaged local practitioners? I don't know if that's possible in the era of COVID right now, but I'm just wondering what your reactions are as you were challenging IASC. You know, how, how can IASC help in your minds? Uh, Charles, is that for me or for you, Baristo? For either one, whoever has thoughts on that question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. I was quite specific uh, in terms of uh, what I was hoping our experts in the sector can do. We need Africa based Africa led models yeah. for governing water commons, but also other commons. Uh, and I think this is doable. Uh, we just need to put our, put our heads together and start collaborating more frequently and uh, developing these models that are really applicable to our own circumstances, even though we borrow from other regions and glo glo global normative frameworks. That was my call. Thank you. Yeah. Ever yeah, maybe I think that is a, a very good call. In fact, one of the reasons for having these uh, regional uh, uh, units is specifically to address the regional questions. What are the specific questions, uh, uh, common issues within the region? And we are actually in the process of expanding this uh, and uh, through several mechanisms, uh, we have done these forums. I think that's one of them. And we are also expanding on the youth, uh, uh, I think so for those who participated, there was quite a dynamic uh, youth grouping as well. So I think engaging policymakers would be one of the issues that we need to focus on. And uh, I think I'm also noting this so that as a, a regional grouping, we can organize this uh, and try to expand on it. And one of the other things maybe as a last comment is that uh, we've also been trying to expand our work because we talk about uh, Africa, but if you look at, uh, uh, Francophone Africa, we have very little representation, so we are also trying to expand the, uh, and include uh, what the commons issues within the uh, Francophone uh, Africa region. So that would be it. I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, we, we work on that. Well, thank you, Everesto, for your leadership, as you've done already. Um, I think at this time, it's a, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to uh, start closing, but uh, Dr. Claudius, thank you for putting the slides up. I just wanted to draw attendees' attention to um, what's going on with World Commons Week this week. Uh, you're, you're seeing the slide for the North America um, talk that's already happened, but I want to draw your attention to the, um, the, the uh, IESC, the World Commons Week 2020 website has links to the video recordings of both um, Frank's North America talk, and now you're seeing uh, Fabio's Latin American talk. That was done in Spanish. Next slide. As we move forward, uh, later today, um, we're having the Australia talk. And as you may know, on all of the webinar pages on World Commons Week webinars, you can uh, find out what time it is in your own time zone. There's a link to do that on each page. Uh, we've got the European one coming up on October 7th. Uh, and this one's on marine and coastal commons. Keep going, the next slide. Um, and we have one in China that's happening also on uh, October 7th. Um, this will be in Chinese uh, on COVID-19 as a commons. And this one I'm particularly excited about. This is, a, a ISC's got a new early career network that's um, been formed and is very active. And uh, so on October 8th, we'll have a special two hour session where we'll be highlighting research um, done by the, the uh, speakers on your screen. Next slide. And, and then we'll be closing the <coughs> webinar week with uh, uh, Aline uh, uh, and closing the Asia keynote on coastal commons um, and in Japan. This slide is actually just showing, that's okay, yeah, the map is showing you some of the local events or, or, or locations where people are participating. Um, you can see that on the local events page. Uh, last slide. 
Um, and I wanted to draw your attention to the upcoming IASC conferences. So the biannual conference is going to be at Arizona State University, still an open question as to whether it'll be in person or if it'll be online next October, a year from now. But there's also a whole set of online pre-conference virtual events coming, which you can see on the right of the screen. Um, you can find all of this on the IESC Commons um, website. And then the last slide, Dr. Claudius. So um, on behalf of IESC and the World Commons Week uh, 2020 organizers, we'd like to thank all the attendees for being here. We really had, I know you can't see it, but we had a really nice number of att attendees and we really appreciate your time and attention. Uh, Evaristo, thank you for organizing this really interesting keynote, and especially to Dr. Claudius for preparing and giving this very interesting address. We, we don't have any way to clap, but feel free to raise your hand in the participant window <laughs> as a signal of high five uh, for a great talk. And on that, on behalf of the World's Commons Week and IASC, um, thank you for attending, and if you like what you're seeing, consider uh, supporting IAC and joining as a member. With that, I'll close um, and spread the word. This will be record. The recording will be up on the the website, the World Commons Week 2020 website, for people to see after uh, uh, if they weren't able to attend today. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, have a wonderful day, whatever time it is where you are, and uh, um, thanks again. Cheers. Cheers. I, I guess we'll st we'll keep the, the the Zoom meeting going if anyone wants to stay. Uh, Dr. Claudius, I don't know if you have time for five minutes more in case somebody wants to say something. But uh, yes, I'm still here. Uh, no problem. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's still okay. a few people uh, who attendees here. Uh, I'm going to, I think, try to allow to talk anybody who wants to say anything. Um, yeah. So, so attendees, you're unmuted if anybody has anything they want to say. Maybe they're not unmuted. Yeah. So yeah, you can um, unmute, I think, attendees. Yeah, if, if we found a way of capturing the, the Zoom chat uh, posts. Uh, so that yeah, we don't I am, uh, no, I have already copied all the questions in the chat, uh, oh, and, chat and, and put them in Word. And put them in Word. Ah, yeah. Perfect. perfect. So, uh, yeah. Alicia um, looks like wants to speak. Uh, Alicia, you okay. need to unmute if you can do it on your end. I can't. Um, Maybe, oh, maybe that was a hand to say. Oh, no, she says that she, she was clipping. She was clipping. She was clipping. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, and uh, um, I see Carlos and Luis is on still. I don't know if they have anything they want to say before we break. Okay, I think, okay. I think we're good. Yeah. I think Thank we are good you. for questions that, yeah. I'm going to stop. No, thank you very much.